This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. This lecture is on Chapter 3 of the free lecture notes, which is Management of Working Capital. Uh, and it's the first of several chapters on uh, working capital. It's a, a key area of the exam. Uh, and there are various aspects uh, on which it can be examined. Uh, so in some ways it's um, a bit of an introductory uh, chapter. Uh, be clear what we mean by working capital, you'll see on the first page of the notes, it's uh, the net current assets. The uh, current assets, the inventories, receivables, uh, the cash, uh, less the payables. Um, and it's important to appreciate why it needs managing properly. Uh, because I've written up there a very, very um, simple and outlined statement of financial position. And you should be familiar, obviously, with the layout. Uh, but this business, they've got um, 100,000 invested in um, non current assets, the machines, etc. Current assets are 20. Uh, the share capital and reserves, 90,000. The non-current liabilities, long-term loans, 25. And current liabilities are five. So I hope it adds up. Yes, it does. And be clear what's happening. You see, this company has a total of 115,000 long-term finance. And what are they doing with that uh, 115,000 they've raised? Some from shareholders, some from long term loans. They've invested most of it in the non current assets, in machines, etc. Uh, and of course, it's those that actually are going to earn the profits. Uh, but what's happened to the other 15,000? The other 15,000 is the working capital. Uh, the 20,000 current assets less the 5,000 current liabilities. Uh, and of course, um, any business needs to have some current assets. Um, uh, I say any business, I mean, it depends on the type of business. But any normal business is going to be selling on credit and they'll have receivables. Uh, if they didn't sell on credit, uh, they'd probably lose out to competitors. So in order to run the business, they need a certain level of receivables. They need to carry a certain level of inventory to make sure that they can supply uh, customers. And they'll need to carry some short term cash uh, in order, obviously, to pay the bills. And so in order to operate the business, they need receivables, inventory, cash. Uh, and of course, you'd normally expect them to buy goods on credit. And so there will be an element of um, payables, current liabilities. But although they need that working capital to be able to run the business, again, they've got to have some inventory to be able to supply customers and so on, the working capital itself isn't actually earning profits. It's the machines that are going to earn the profits, the non-current assets. And so it is important the working capital is managed properly. If the working capital is too high for the type of business, if they're carrying far too much inventory, if they're uh, allowing customers far too long uh, a period to pay, and therefore receivables are too high, then not only is it inefficient, you know, carrying too much inventory, there's a danger you might never sell it. It becomes old and obsolete. So not only is it inefficient, but that 15,000 has effectively been borrowed. 100,000 in non-current assets, 15,000 in working capital. They've borrowed that money, it's part of the 115 long-term finance. And it's costing them to borrow money. The, the shareholder finance, they'll be wanting a dividend. Obviously, uh, long-term loans will be having to pay interest. So it's costing money to get that 15,000, and the 15,000 isn't actually earning anything. And so although we accept we need a level of working capital, we do need to manage it properly. We don't want to let it get too high, because you know we'd be better off 
repaying some of the borrowing and saving uh, interest or dividend, or having more cash available to invest in new machines and make more profit. It's vital that the working capital is managed properly, that you know we decide what levels needed for our type of business, but we watch it and make sure that inventories don't get too high, make sure that we're not giving customers uh, too long a period of credit and so on. So that's why it's so important uh, that we manage it properly. Uh, and I say this chapter in some ways is fairly introductory. In later chapters uh, we'll look at how we perhaps should go about managing our receivables, managing our inventory, managing our cash. Um, so that's what we're talking about. Um, if you look over the page, though, at paragraph four, it talks about the financing of working capital. You see, in the simple um, statement of financial position that you, is on the screen at the moment, that 15,000 has all been financed by long-term finance, share capital with reserves, non-current liabilities. It's long-term money that's being used for the working capital. Now, the alternative will be to use short-term money. You know, instead of having that loan of 25,000, a long-term loan, they could have used overdraft finance. And the 25,000, therefore, would be a current liability. The 15,000 has to be financed from somewhere. The question is, Shall we use long-term uh, finance or short-term finance, overdraft-type finance? Um, and it used to be the case that people said, oh, non-current assets, because they are long-term assets, they should be financed by long-term capital, whereas uh, working capital, short-term assets, financed by short-term finance. However, Although there's no rule as to the best way to finance the working capital, uh, the problem with short-term finance is that it, it's going to be a, a lot more risky. You know, if you borrow money from an overdraft, um, the bank can call in the overdraft at any time you want. And it can cause us big liquidity problems that we run out of cash. Whereas, of course, long-term finance if you've had a loan for 10 years, you know, you're safe for 10 years. It's only in 10 years' time you've got to worry about how we're going to repay it. On the other hand, short-term finance, not as a rule, not always the case, but does stand to be cheaper. Uh, because long-term finance, if you've borrowed 25,000 long-term, you're committed to paying interest on 25,000. But working capital stands to fluctuate. You know, you, you, you sell goods, you have high receivables, they pay your receivables go down, inventories are going up and down. And so, from day to day, you won't always need the full 15,000. Uh, and if you're borrowing from an overdraft, as your overdraft goes up and down, as you need more or less money, um, the interest goes up and down. Long-term finance, you're paying interest on that full 25,000 all the time. So the point is, short-term finance, on the one hand, can end up being cheaper, but um, is a lot more risky. And so the standard approach, and it's all written there, do read it, obviously, when uh, I finished all this talking. Um, the approach that we would normally recommend is that the average level of working capital should be financed by long term borrowings. If on average we've always got around 20,000, I'm making up a figure, 20,000 working capital, then okay, borrow 20,000 long term finance for it. But day by day, you know, as you might need uh, some days a bit more than 20, well, the extra 
uh, bar out from short-term finance. Uh, you'll see the, um, the paragraph towards the end of that uh, page uh, is written in bold. Permanent working capital is what we call the long-term average working capital. The suggestion is that that should be financed by long-term borrowing. Whereas the day-to-day -day fluctuations, some days you might need a bit more than average. Well, that's the temporary working capital, and that perhaps would be better borrowed uh, from short-term uh, finance, from overdraft type finance. All right, well, that was all chat. On the next page, you'll see mention of working capital ratios, all of which, in fact, you should have seen before uh, in earlier exams, uh, F2, F3, F5. Uh, but ratios to be aware of, uh, just overall measures of the level of working capital before we start looking in detail at the individual bits of it. So you've got there the current ratio, which again, you really should be familiar with. That's the current assets uh, divided by the current liabilities. In my little example here, current assets are 20, current liabilities are five. And so the current ratio uh, had to be 20,000 over 5,000. It's four. And that's just a very simplistic measure of how how much liquidity we've got in the short term. You see, this company in the short term can easily pay off its liabilities. Cash, receivables, uh, inventory are 20. The payables are only five. But um, we'd always want that ratio to be more than one, I think fairly obviously. If this company had current assets of 20 and current liabilities of 21,000, the current ratio would be less than one, but it would be a very dangerous position because in the short term they wouldn't be able to pay the bills. Um, they risk ending up uh, having to uh, go into liquidation to close down. Uh, the quick ratio, <coughs> uh, exactly the same idea except we exclude inventory. The reason is this, that um, your current liabilities, I don't know, maybe we take a month's credit from suppliers so we'd have to pay that 5,000 in a month's time. In our current assets, whatever cash we've got, of course, is immediately available for paying those bills. The receivables, well, hopefully, in a month's time, the money will have come in from receivables and we can use it in a month's time to pay the payables. Uh, but the problem with inventory is for it to turn into cash, First of all, we have to sell the goods, you know, and that might take several weeks before we sell them. And then if we sell them on credit, we've got to wait again to get the money in. And so in the very short term, the inventory cash might not be there when it comes time to pay the payables. And so in the very short term, the quick ratio, or its other name is the acid test ratio, um, current assets minus inventory over current liabilities. It'll be a lower figure than the current ratio. We'd expect it to be nearer to one, but again, we'd want it to be more than one to be certain we're able to buy our bills. Um, the efficiency ratios, inventory turnover, receivables turnover, etc. Well, I'll explain what we mean by looking at something that you may have seen before, but maybe not, but is examined in F9, which is the operating cycle. And so, if you look over the page, what the operating cycle is, is this. Suppose, I mean, the way a business operates, we'll have inventories, and maybe I start off, I've got some goods, maybe I hold inventory uh, on average, I've got 20 days of inventory. On average, I've got enough inventory to supply customers for 20 days, or to put it another way, 
it'll be sitting in inventory the goods for 20 days before I actually sell them and I'm one step closer to getting the cash. Uh, however when I do sell them I sell on credit and we've then got receivables and making up figures maybe I give customers 30 days credit and so from the moment I've bought my goods, if I buy goods and then sell them, from the moment I buy them, it's 50 days before we actually get the cash in. It's 50 days when I'm without the cash. The only thing that sort of relieves us a bit is because when I buy the goods, I buy them, when I buy the goods, I don't pay them immediately. Uh, maybe ooh, I take 25 days credit. So I've got payables. Again, I'm making up these figures. We'll look at a full example in a minute. But if I take 25 days credit, it's 25 days before the cash goes out. So I buy goods, it's 25 days before I actually have to spend the cash. Uh, the goods sit in inventory and then I um, sell them and sell on credit. It's a total of 50 days before we get the cash back. And so how many days are we without cash? From the day we, uh, the cash goes out to the day the cash comes back in. Uh, 50 minus 25, it's 25 days. And we call that the operating cycle. Or as you can see on the, at the top of the page, the cash operating cycle of the working capital cycle. And so it's an overall measure of how long we've we'll been without cash. And surely any business would want to keep that period as short as possible. How can they make that period shorter? Uh, they could make it shorter by having less inventory. So inventory only sitting there, only 10 days worth of inventory. They could make it shorter by getting receivables to pay faster. If we receivables pay us faster, we get the cash in sooner. Or we can make it shorter by taking longer credit from our suppliers. If we uh, took 30 days instead of 25 days to pay suppliers, again, the operating cycle will get shorter. Now, I've already said we're going to look at each aspect of it separately in the later chapters. But the operating cycle is just an overall measure of, again, how long it is that we're without cash. Well, as I said, this is examined. It's never going to be um, a great long question. But um, certainly, uh, you're very likely to be asked a few marks to check you understand what the operating cycle is and possibly to do bits of calculations on it. So have a look with me at example one here. Uh, the table below gives information extracted from the annual financial statements of management PLC for the past year. So it's just an extract from um, statement to financial position, from statement to profit or loss. Uh, the inventories, well here we produce our own goods, so we've got inventories of raw materials, 108,000. There's inventory of work in progress, uh, part finished goods, 75,600. Inventory of finished goods, 86,400. So there are inventories. Uh, if you jump to the bottom, uh, the receivables, 172,800, the payable state is 6,400. So we've got information from our centre financial position about inventories, receivables, payables. And from the um, statement of profit or loss, we know what the purchases of raw materials were. We know what the cost of production was. We're producing our own goods, so we buy raw materials and then we have to spend money on labour, etc., producing goods. Uh, and we know the cost of goods sold. Cost of production as adjusted for um, inventories. 
And of course, we know the sales. We are asked to uh, calculate the length of the working capital cycle or the operating cycle, assuming three, six, five days in a year. If you do get uh, any bit of this in the exam, do check. The examiner often says assume 360 days in a year, uh, in which case you'd be rather stupid to assume 365. Anyway, I've left space here for the uh, solution. Don't just learn rules. You know, the more you see the uh, logic, the less learning there is. But let's work down it. First of all, receivables days. Uh, a measure of uh, how many days credit we appear to be giving our customers. And as you can see, we take the average receivables, which are what? 172,800. Uh, divided by the sales for the year, 864,000. So that proportion of our sales, 170 divided by 160, that proportion of our sales for the year are uh, in receivables, and therefore it would appear, if there are 365 days in the year, that we're giving how many days credit? 172,800 as a proportion of 864,000. It's point two, so 20% of our uh, sales for the year are in receivables. Multiply by 365, I get 73 days. So it would appear we seem to be giving about 73 days credit to customers. Now, two things there. First of all, you can't say whether we're giving too much credit or not. It depends on the type of business and our competitors. You know, if all our competitors are giving two months credit, we're going to have to give two months credit, otherwise we'll lose business. On the other hand, if our competitors are giving one month's credit and we're taking, what, over two months, then it suggests we're not doing very well, not collecting very well. Uh, secondly, although strictly we should use average receivables for the, for the year as a proportion of the sales on credit as opposed to sales for cash, make the best use of the information given in the exam. You see, usually we're only given sales for the year and therefore we assume they're on credit. Usually we only know receivables at the end of the year and so we've no choice but to assume that that is, you know, the average receivables. But it, it can be rather dangerous. You know, it could be that we've um, just made a lot of sales just before the year end. And so receivables are unusually high. Or conversely, they could be unusually low. So it's always dangerous using these um, sorts of ratios. But I say, make the best use use common sense on what you're given in the exam. Uh, what about inventory days? How many days do we appear to be holding inventory? Well, we've got these three types, so finished goods. Um, the finished goods, again, although ideally we'd use the average for the year, normally we've only got year-end figures. And the inventories of finished goods are 86,400. Inventories, of course, are valued at cost. And so we take that as a proportion of the cost of sales. And the cost of sales on the, in the question, 756,000. So we're selling 756 a year. We happen to have 86,400 in inventory. And so it would appear that we're carrying enough inventory to last us for uh, to the nearest, I'm going to do to the nearest days. So 42 days. Now again, you can't say whether that's good or bad. Depends on the type of business. Uh, it depends on our competitors. 
But as always, we want to keep these things as low as possible. Uh, what about work in progress? The work in progress, 75,600. Uh, here, these are the part finished goods that we're producing. And so divide by the cost of production, which is 675,000. Seventy five six hundred divided by six seventy five thousand times three six five forty one days. Now these are part finished goods. The way to reduce that will be to produce faster. The faster we're making goods, the fewer items there'll be that are part finished at any stage. And finally, raw materials. Uh, the raw materials inventory, 108,000. Uh, the total raw material purchases, I think again it should be purchases on credit, no choice here, but raw material purchases, 518,400. Uh, 108,000. 518. 400 times 365, I get 76 days, which again does seem rather high, but again, depends on the type of business we're in. And so the total so far, uh, from the day we buy our raw materials, which then become work in progress, which then become finished goods, uh, which then uh, are sold, but we have to wait till they pay. So from the day we buy the raw materials till the day we get the cash in would appear to be 73 plus 42 plus 41 plus 76. At 2.32 days. As I hope I, I made clear earlier, the one thing that alleviates that is of course the raw materials we don't pay for immediately we buy them we buy on credit and so how long is it before we pay them now uh, the payables days the average payables are 86 400 our purchases on credit uh, 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 518 400 And therefore, I get 61 days. So from the day we purchase the raw materials, it's 61 days until we pay out the cash. It's 232 days before we receive cash. And therefore, the period we're in a sense, without cash, the operating cycle is 171 days. And as I said earlier, any business wants to keep that as low as possible. Again, we accept we have to give credit to customers because competitors do. We accept we have to keep some inventories in order to run the business. But we need to manage them properly. We need to check, is 73 days for receivables a reasonable period? Can we get the money in sooner? Do we need all that inventory or can we reduce it? Uh, do we need to pay payables in 61 days or can we take longer? The lower that operating cycle, the better. I know I've been repeating a lot and um, just one final thing I've said. These on their own, you can't say much about it. It depends on the type of business, the competition. We can compare from year to year, though. You know, if it's going down, we're managing better, perhaps that's a good sign. The only thing I would comment here, though, we're paying our payables in uh, 61 days. We're taking 73 days to collect from our customers. It's really ideally. You'd want to get the money in from your customers 
at least as quickly as the time it's taking to pay your payables. Anyway, I've chatted rather a lot there. There is one more thing in this chapter, but I'll um, leave this lecture here. The next lecture, I'll explain what we mean by overcapitalization uh, and overtrading.